Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so did I have Rodrigo Lorero on the line, and he is managing partner at Cyberverse Advisors, and he's also a global executive technology leader. Uh, Rodrigo, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Adam. All right, Rodrigo. So, man, I've been trying to get you on this show for a long time now, and I'm excited to finally have you on because I want to know what's going on in cybersecurity. I mean, I know you're busy and got a lot going on. I you, you, I know you're going to be speaking at Davos later this year um, and a right. couple other things. And, I, and then starting Cyberverse Advisors, another big announcement. Well, um, we're going to get into all of this, and I'm excited. But um, before we do, we'll start this episode the way that we start them all with our Mission Matters Minute. So Rodrigo, we at Mission Matters amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. Rodrigo, what mission matters to you? The mission that matters to me is is really at the convergence of technology and and security. I always was a very technology-oriented person. You know, I think I was 12 years old when I started coding and developing code on the on the computer that my my father gave to me when I was twelve, and then during my my professional career, then I took a turn onto cybersecurity, and I'm very glad that I did, because I I think that technology plays an incredibly important role in our lives, in the lives of everybody. Nobody can survive without technology. No company can survive without technology. But what happened, you know, let's say over the last uh, fifteen to twenty years, is that you can't survive with technology without cybersecurity. Unfortunately, the bad guys are out there. So for me, it's extremely important to make sure that technology continues to benefit the world rather than technology uh, holding back the world and being another, another uh, uh, source of problems in the world. That's why uh, cybersecurity matters to me. And at the end of the day is because technology, we're all about the technology society and we can't do it without cybersecurity. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. And uh, one of the reasons I was excited to have you on the show is because for us, I mean, cybersecurity is a hot topic and you have a unique vantage point. I mean, given the amount of years that you've been in the field. Um, so you mentioned, you know, obviously starting when you were 12 uh, uh, with your, your first computer. I mean, take us a little bit further down the line in your career. Like, when did you know cybersecurity was going to be your niche or like your expertise? Like, when did that come about? Because even the field of cybersecurity, the way that we know it now, it's not that old. Absolutely not. It's it's not at all. It's a very it's a very new field, yeah. and uh, it, actually it's a it's a very interesting story. As I said, I was I, I'm first and foremost a technology guy, a technology person, and uh, I I recall uh, you know it was probably about uh, you know 15, 15, 17 years ago or something like that. Uh, I was working at the company where we developed software, mm -hmm. and uh, I was chief architect back then. So. Uh, what I like to call the the, the chief nerd, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was responsible for the architecture and the development of all of our software solutions at the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, like many other organizations back at the time, the organization was pivoting from doing software sales to doing software as a service sale, meaning yeah. that the company was now holding the data of the client. And uh, I remember back then uh, I was sitting in my office and uh, the general manager walked into my office and he says, well, Rodrigo, the CIO of the client is coming in tomorrow and he's bringing the CISO and he has a whole bunch of security questions to ask that we never had to answer because this will be our first so software as a service wow. sale. Can you handle it? Adam, honestly, my answer was like, well, I never really looked into it, but how hard can it be? And then it just dawned on me and I started researching and, and investigating what we would need to do to comply with all the requests. And I, I just fell in love. I, I, I saw that that is really the mission of technology to safeguard the information, safeguard all of the data. So I've kind of stumbled, to be honest, onto, onto my cybersecurity career because of the need uh, the, that my company had to really address and enforce cybersecurity. So that's how I got started, just 
by accident, I was just there and I needed to do a job and I did my job. Wow. And that's a very interesting um, point in time that you're mentioning there. When, when companies move from just, you know, you buy the box, you buy the software, it's done, go ahead and run it. And you got your own servers, maybe whatever else you go and run it versus the new SaaS model, which uh, and even to say new, right? Like SaaS, it's such a part of our, our society now that to even think about what the security implications are, you know, on the back end, like that was a really pivotal time, wasn't it? Absolutely pivotal. Uh, you know, it was pivotal for for both sides, for yeah. for the the vendor side and the client side, because it represented on one side. You know, for the ones that I was representing, the vendors, uh, it represented the shift from a one time sale to a recurring revenue. So mm-hmm. the companies that were involved into it, you know, uh, at the enterprise level, we may have done a sale of a software and we get a big project to implement it and it's 10, 15 million dollars. And then the company shifts to a SaaS model where we suddenly were signing contracts that could be 100 million dollars over five years. So for the vendors, it's a pivotal change because it it brings that recurring revenue, that forecast, that uh, steady revenue coming into the company, that then the vendors can invest more money in developing the software solutions. From the client side, it's also a pivotal moment for organizations because uh, these organizations, their business is not IT. Their business is not technology. They sell you know, a bank, they, they sell loans, they, they sell uh, mortgages. And up until then, the, these companies, all the companies have always massive uh, IT teams and they had to be always concerned about their data centers, how to run the business and everything else. What SaaS brings to the table is that the client organizations, the banks can now rely upon the vendors uh, to take care of the, the dirty hand, the dirty mm-hmm. of hosting the environment. And the people that are highly specialized about hosting the environment and securing the environment. So it's really a pivotal moment, I would say, both for the vendors and the the clients, where on one hand, the vendors can invest more in creating better products and more secure products. And on the other side, the companies can devote more energy to their core business, less energy to, to running IT, to running technology, and associated with that also is a, a decrease in the costs. So at that moment in time, uh, the, the banks and all the large organizations, when they shift to that model, suddenly uh, they have a lowering of, of their operational costs related to technology management. Yeah, there's there was a lot of wins there and, and the shift. Um, I mean, and has it worked? I mean, you know, for some it has, for some it hasn't. But um, overall, when I when I think about not having to have a large uh, tech from the you know the consumer side of things, not having to worry about having a large uh, tech staff for certain things that don't know you need it because we can benefit from SaaS products. I mean, I think it's amazing. Um, yes. I want to uh, shift focus here a little bit. So um, some news that I got as we've been reconnecting over the last, you know, six months or so and kind of planning up for this interview um, is uh, so you've made the decision now with, with to launch uh, Cyberverse Advisors. I know you're working with some of the same um, with, with similar solutions that you've in the past, like um, like New Push. And we'll get into some of the, the granular stuff in a bit. But I want to start with Cyberverse Advisors. So how did this come about? You know, I worked for for many years at that company that I, that I talked about, where we built uh, software software and then uh, hosted software for uh, large bank financial organizations across the world, the big and, and the best uh, banks in the world. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in 2015, uh, they came a big challenge to me. The, uh, they reached out to me and and they they, they asked me to to come and develop a brand new information security company Mm -hmm. for a large global company uh, that uh, wanted to go public. So I shifted gears. I I went to the the client side and spent my next uh, five to seven years building a world-class information security program. And then along the way, because no deed goes unpunished, uh, along the way, uh, I I became actually the the global CIO for, for the company. Yeah. But after all of this journey, and I spent about seven years uh, at the company, uh, 
great company, great people, I, I really found myself wondering uh, how else can I contribute and how, how else can I share uh, my expertise of all of these two decades. And then came to the, to the realization, and this may have been part of my uh, background, part of, of, of my style of person that I've been for 20 years a consultant. I, I, I think I, I started to feel the need to go back to the consulting side, to go back to being able to provide services, provide advice to a large number of clients. And that's when I, I, I decided uh, I, I had a good corporate key career, I, I, I reached the top, now it's time for me to go on my own and really uh, provide back to a, a lot, large number of companies, a little bit of the advice and the lessons learned that I accumulated uh, over the years, hence my decision to not only be in that uh, realm of uh, uh, cybersecurity and uh, strategic and technology advisory services, but uh, I also became very involved in a number of uh, uh, venture capitalist funds. I'm uh, I'm advising uh, with uh, with some some venture capital funds into what startups uh, to invest, uh, and I'm working also to uh, as a mentor for some of the startups, trying to 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 have people and companies avoid making the same mistakes that I did. I learned from them and I would like very much uh, to, to see uh, new startups, new companies uh, grow fast and uh, not, not do some of the obvious errors. Everybody will make mistakes, but there are some obvious mistakes that uh, I think I can impart a little bit of, of my uh, uh, knowledge and, and experience and, and coach and uh, mentor companies uh, in the right direction. Man, I, I just, it sounds like it's come full circle. Like a career has come full circle and now you're finding other ways to become um, more of a benefit in other ways. So this is, it's awesome. It's a great story. Um, so I have to ask, um, cybersecurity 2022, it's a broad question, but it's intentionally broad because I want your vantage point. Like what's interesting that you're seeing right now? Like what kind of trends are you seeing? So, uh, you know, whenever you you research the topic in terms of trends and what's happening, you know, people typically, and, and you'll see all of these articles on, on the press, on the websites, on blogs, top five trends, top 10 tens, the top five, top three. Um, for me, it all boils down to really a big macro trend. And the big macro trend is that the traditional technology environment is, is gone. Uh, the traditional technology environment is gone. And, and uh, this started a few years ago with this trend from software implementations where the banks had their secure data center and now they're on the cloud, now they're, they're working SaaS yeah. and then accelerated very, very fast uh, with the, the, the COVID, COVID pandemic. Uh, because now companies and just pick your... Uh, whatever, whatever, whatever company that you have. So the companies, they no longer have their own private data centers. They don't control the data center. They're on the cloud. They're, they're on the public cloud, on the hybrid cloud. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now with COVID, now they don't even have an office. Now, where do the employees work? Well, I don't know. Uh, from home, from, from the swimming pool, uh, from, uh, from the cafe, from the, the airport, from the back of their car. You yeah. don't know. So what uh, what happened with the combination of these factors with the hybrid and the remote work model and the transition to a very cloud centric environment, a hybrid cloud and and companies use more than one cloud provider. What has happened, you know, and I'll uh, be a little bit technical here, is that the attack surface has exploded. And the attack service is a big word to just say that there are more opportunities for hackers to penetrate your corporate environment. And you don't control the corporate environment. What has been uh, said is that there's no longer uh, what's called the network perimeter. You can't mm. put the gate and some barbed wire around your stuff because your stuff is everywhere. Your employees are not in the office. Your computers are not in your data center, are somewhere. So uh, the, the attack surface has exploded and so have exploded 
the number of opportunities, the number of entry points that hackers have into your environment. And this means that you need to deploy an ever increasing number of cybersecurity tools. You need to control uh, the identities that the, the employees uh, and the, and your partners use. And you know, one area that is in very topic of the day, supply chain. The supply chain also has a digital uh, equivalent. It means that one company, they have a number of employees, but then they have hundreds of contractors, hundreds of service providers, and all of them have to log in to your servers that are, we don't know where, in which cloud providers, and you don't control any of those things. So the attack service has completely exploded. And in my opinion, what has happened is then when you come with these top five lists, mm-hmm. all of them are some flavor or some variation of the fact that the attack surface uh, has exploded. Yeah, and and let's listening to you kind of hear about that. Now, obviously, I don't work in cybersecurity, but from my end of things, as you and I know other business owners and entrepreneurs out there that'll watch this and executives, um, they're going to be thinking about this. Is when you when you kind of go down that timeline and the effects of like you know. COVID, the pandemic, people working from home, especially for financial institutions. I, I mean, I was in finance for, you know, almost 14 years and I worked for, you know, really big companies, you know, um, and thinking about like when I, you know, I still have friends and people that, you know, that I know that still work at these companies. When I think about them working from home, like it blew my mind. Never did I think like financial advisors at these particular companies, huge companies would be working from home or have, you know, client data on their, of course, company laptop, right? And I'm sure they're putting, they're doing the, you know, what they need to do, um, we hope in terms of cybersecurity to keep the client data safe. But just the fact that it was even on a screen in somebody's home, like it just took me back. I'm like, wow, I just couldn't even imagine it. And then I was thinking about, okay, these are, these are some of the premier financial institutions that let's just say have a lot to lose if they don't get it right. Then I started thinking going further down the supply chain or not supply chain, but further down the line of let's just say smaller institutions that maybe don't have the exact same funding or other things like that. And then I started really thinking, and I'm like, okay, there's a, there's a lot going on here that maybe doesn't meet the eye, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know, we're now faced with problems that uh, CIOs and, and companies never really thought about, right? Yeah. Uh, and quickly, have- right? Like time frame. So maybe they had to adjust, you know, they had years to plan in the past and now it was just like, snap your fingers. Hey, like, like almost like the first time that uh, it was brought to your table. Hey, Rodrigo, you think you could do this? It's our first SaaS client, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know, companies have secured their environments and, you know, you bring uh, uh, financial companies and you have experience in financial companies, you know, when you were working there for, for those uh, more than a decade, you know how stringent you had to use your machine and your laptop and everything else. But now remember, people are working from home and, you know, you're using your home router, right? Yeah. Your home router has not been inspected by any security expert, but your data goes through that router. The data of all your, of, of your, your customers go through that router. So this is what I mean by the explosion in the attack surface, the number of opportunities for an attacker to hack into a company. So now they can hack into the router that you, that you have at your home mm-hmm. or your webcam that you have at your desk or the, all the cameras that you have around your office. Uh, uh, around your home. And typically those are the $20 cameras coming from China. They, we don't know where the firmware comes from of those cameras. I, we don't know how often they are updated. And that's a, a practical example of what I meant by the complete explosion of the attack surface and the implications that it has on the environment and the problem that uh, right now uh, the, the cybersecurity world needs to be focused on is really understanding how to secure this extraordinary complex uh, computing environment. So I want to, and I know we we talked about cyberverse advisors a little bit um, earlier in the interview, but I want to I want to kind of circle back to that because I think this is a good point. Um, so I, and we know what the problem is, and we've you've, t- you've done a good job on kind of showing us the outline and you know how some of this may have accelerated that macro view of of what's going on. 
Um, so now when we're thinking about cyber advisors and let's get further into maybe some of the solution part of this. So um, tell me more about connective platform and new push and maybe how that kind of fits in this whole puzzle. Yes. When I, back when I was on my previous company, the company, a very interesting company, uh, owned uh, 65 di- different universities around the globe in, uh, in uh, 27 different countries, uh, a total of over 200 campuses around the world, each one of them with their Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. So essentially, since 2015, I lived in this environment of an incre- incredibly expanded attack surface. Mm-hmm. And I've learned a lot of lessons. I, I deployed a lot of security tools. I developed a very robust security program for the for for the organization mm-hmm. that would essentially cover all of the environment you know we're talking about a company that serviced over 1 million students wow. and uh, jokingly uh, i am um, i would always tell the people that i was uh, you know when i would go to a conference back in the days where people get got together for conferences right uh, i would go to a conference and, and i would announce to everybody well Every day I have 1 million potential hackers on my network. <laughs> and, and, and that's where, the, where I really trained myself as a cybersecurity leader yeah. over the past seven years is really in developing solutions, developing protections, developing security controls to really secure an environment uh, that is incredibly uh, diverse, mm-hmm. multiple countries mo- across multiple continents, uh, 200 campuses, different cultures, different teams, uh, over uh, almost 3,000 uh, IT employees or about 70,000 uh, internal employees. Mm-hmm. And I've secured that environment. I made that environment secure. The company successful did its, its IPO. And we, over my stewardship, we didn't have any uh, cybersecurity incidents or any, any incidents of, of, of that nature. So it, that tells me that the approach that I had uh, to secure that environment worked. And, you know, that was also part of the, um, of, of, of the reason why I decided to, to exit and, and be on, on, on my own and provide these services to the outside is because I wanted to create a solution that embodies all the lessons learned that I had over these years and everything that I put in in practice, I can wrap it around uh, one solution that I can offer to other uh, organizations and entities that that have this need. And all of them are dealing with this exploded uh, attack surface. So that's what the connective platform really is, is, is is a platform that allows the company to have full visibility, full control of all their assets uh, across all of their environment uh, and extract that and consolidate, aggregate all of that information across the assets, across the identities that are used by the people to log into those assets. And those are the three cornerstones of a good security program Program is the assets, and by assets, I mean the physical computers and servers and so forth, the identities, which is essentially the user IDs that you use to log into the machines, and the people. And we have to secure those three things. Mm-hmm. The, the machines, we have to secure the identities, and we have to secure the people because they always say mm-hmm. the people are the weakest link in the, in the cybersecurity environment. So we need to bring all of them together and secure all of them in order to have a a very uh, secure environment. So what kind of um, what kind of companies or organizations is a solution like this um, um, appropriate for? So is this you mentioned, of course, uh, universities, things like that. Um, Tell me a little bit more like what what type of is there a specific industries this is better for than others? Is this an enterprise solution? Like give me a little bit more on that. I would say that um, any any, uh, company that has a high degree of complexity in their computing environment would be the the ideal target uh, Mm -hmm. for these types of solutions. Um, You know, I'm working uh, specifically with uh, educational companies because I have a lot of experience in that space. 
uh, working with the financial services companies because I have a lot of experience in that in that space and also working uh, with government organizations because they have a lot of complexity uh, in, in in their environments. Those are uh, you know three of the the main target areas yeah. that uh, I'm looking at, but that is more because. I am limited in time and bandwidth to devote myself to all of the industries. Mm -hmm. But as long as there is a high degree of complexity, uh, the the solution and the approach is really agnostic in terms of what type of industry uh, it is uh, suited for. So obviously with any changes in cybersecurity, I mean, things take time, right? Um, let's talk about deployment. Maybe, um, you know, maybe what a normal deployment would look like versus what deployment of this, of, of new push um, would look like, like time frame wise. Yeah, the, in, in terms of, of, of deployment, the deployment is uh, proportional to the complexity of, of the environment. You know, if we're talking about an environment where, it's a large company with 100,000 employees and uh, with 100 offices uh, with, uh, with a large number of campus. It can be a multi-month uh, endeavor mm-hmm. to deploy uh, a system like that. But even in terms of the, of the deployment, uh, I, one strategy that I always used and uh, everybody that uh, has worked with me probably is tired of, of hearing me say this, <laughs> I always use the crawl, walk, run approach. Uh, I don't believe, and, and uh, if I can be a little bit uh, um, critic of, 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 uh, of my own technology people, is that typically technologies, they tend to, to they have a tendency to do these mega projects, these mm-hmm is two and a half year project where you spend millions upon millions of dollars and I'll get you some results two and a half years from now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the opposite of of what my approach is. I always have an approach uh, that we need to get in there and have quick wins. Uh, We need to show value on on a very short timeframe. And this is exactly what one of the, the ways that uh, I developed the approach uh, for the the connective platform is that you can very quickly demonstrate value of the solution, securing subsets of the organization and Mm -hmm. subsets of the attack surface. So uh, it's very easy to go into into any organization and demonstrate value after two or three months. And that, uh, at the end of the day, is really the value proposition because the value proposition is, you know, if I don't if I don't demonstrate value after three months, you get you can kick me out. <laughs> so obviously, organizations are looking at um, maximizing dollars and maximizing spend. So for some of these like mandatory cybersecurity, like defense things, like you mentioned, financial security, financial institutions, things like that, like. What should, what should organizations be thinking about when it comes to maximizing their dollars? Uh, in terms of ma- maximizing their dollars, uh, the, the, the companies need to understand that uh, they should not put all of their eggs uh, or all of their dollars yeah. uh, into, into technology. Um, I always say there are three components. And, and again, this is also a cliche that a lot of, a lot of people talk about but uh, uh, I'm, I'm a very firm believer on, which is people, process, and technology. Mm-hmm. And uh, typically, uh, CIOs and, and companies spend a lot of money in technology, but then they skimp out on people and they try not to have any processes. And that's a mistake. Uh, you know, you need to equally look at the people that you have in your organization, at the processes that you have in your organization, as well as, as the technology. This is, this is like uh, uh, buying a Ferrari and putting cheap tires on it. It's not going to work. You can't yeah. fully leverage the Ferrari if you don't have good tires. So there needs to be balance in terms of the people, process, and technology. And that is something that I always uh, put forth and, and I work with, uh, with, with my clients to really realize that we need to look at the people, process, and technology. Uh, equal, they are equally important uh, in terms of securing the environment. Mm. It's great. So I have to ask Rodrigo, what's next on your agenda? Um, I know you're you're uh, speaking in Davos coming up. I mean, t- tell me a little bit more about that. 
it, it's true. Uh, I was. Uh, I didn't get the invite, by the way, but it's okay. Send me the video. It's okay. <laughs> I will. I will send you the video. There it will be an, a nice, nice video over, overlooking the the snowy mountains of of, of Davos, and uh, awesome. it's actually very special to me. I'm uh, I'm Portuguese, uh, Portuguese by by citizenship, but I was actually born in Switzerland. So when I got the invite to go to to Davos, it was very uh, important to me. It was like, okay, I'm going back home. No, it's it's a reflection. Uh, it's a reflection of the importance that cybersecurity has today. Mm. That uh, in the World Economic Forum, uh, the organizers of the World Economic Forum and the press events around that, they felt the need. We need to bring people that uh, know about cybersecurity. And uh, most of the surveys and and questionnaires tell us that the number one risk that uh, uh, CEOs today think about is actually cybersecurity. You know, all the things they worry about, uh, that is the risk that keeps uh, CEOs uh, awake at night. Mm -hmm. And if you really take a step back and look not just in terms of the the corporate world, but in terms of the government world, you know, that is something that, you know, let's let's look at the, the current events and the Ukraine war. There is a digital component of this war. So uh, it's absolutely something that corporations cannot survive without and governments and nations cannot survive without. So it's uh, absolutely at the forefront of the thinking of global leaders. So I'm very happy that the World Economic Forum is really uh, uh, considering this as a top uh, problem and is bringing some, some, some experts from around the world to share their opinions and their advices uh, so that we we can go forward and uh, shape uh, the government policies going forward, because obviously part of the capitalist market. Uh, but I, I do believe that the governments have a big role to play in terms of ensuring that the capitalist market does not forget about cybersecurity, because it can still be very tempting for corporations to skimp on uh, to cut the spending on cybersecurity. So it's important when we hear uh, President Biden and other organizations to say, we have to invest more, we have to spend more in cybersecurity. So there is a role for governments to to, to put and create regulations, for example, uh, mandating boards uh, for public companies to have cybersecurity representatives in their board. These are matters that need to be addressed at the cabinet level. And I'm very glad to see that uh, President Biden is addressing cybersecurity uh, at the cabinet level. And companies, they need to address the issue at the board level. Mm. It's great. Great insight there, Rodrigo. Um, I have to say, so I always enjoy our conversations and getting my updates from you. Um, that being said, uh, great to have you on the show. If somebody's watching this and they want to learn more, they want to connect and follow your work, I know I'll be looking forward to that video. Um, what's the best way for people to connect and, and, uh, and to reach out? Mr. Google can help. <laughs> Uh, you can, uh, uh, anybody can go to rodrigolojero.com or cyberverseadvisors.com. Uh, they can uh, reach out to me over at LinkedIn and uh, I'm available to come to you, to talk to you, speak at your event, mm -hmm. because this is, uh, we started and we're going to end the same way, right? This matters. And this matters to me, raising the awareness of cybersecurity. And it's definitely a topic that uh, I'm never tired of talking about. Mm. And uh, I would be ever uh, uh, more than willing to talk at uh, any event or speak to any organization on uh, uh, raising the awareness mm. of uh, the importance of cybersecurity and, and also helping uh, your organization uh, to, to create the necessary security controls in your environment. It does not have to cost millions of dollars. There is basic hygiene, basic secu cybersecurity practices that I still see today that uh, companies do not practice. And that's typically always where I start is to do the basics and then let's go to the to the more complexity. So RodrigoLoher.com, cyber, cyberverseadvisors.com, get in touch.
Perfect. And uh, we'll put all that information in the show notes so that our audience can just head right on over by just clicking on the links. Um, And speaking of the audience, if this is your first time with Mission Matters and the platform, um, we're all about bringing on entrepreneurs, executives, and experts and having them share their mission, why they do what they do, like what gets them excited about their profession and what are the, how are they out there in the market making a difference? Um, If that's the type of content that seems interesting or fun or exciting, exciting to you, um, then definitely hit that subscribe button. We welcome you to. We have many more mission-based individuals coming up on the line, and we don't want you to miss a thing. Uh, Rodrigo, always a pleasure. Looking forward to getting that video from you and uh, wishing you the best. Thank you. See you soon.